the 2020 Holberg Lecture. My name is Ellen Mortensen, and I'm the academic director of the Holberg Prize. It is a well-established tradition that we ask the Holberg Laureate each year to give a Holberg Lecture, which is meant to be the Laureate's academic statement at the time of receiving the Holberg Prize. Under normal circumstances, the Norwegian government and the Holberg Prize would welcome the laureates to a week of celebrations in Bergen and Oslo in early June. <clears throat> this was not possible last year, nor is it possible this year, due to the entry restrictions that follow from the pandemic. The celebration of last year's laureates thus had to be postponed. The 2020 Holberg Laureate, Professor Griselda Pollock, will therefore be celebrated this year together with the 2021 Holberg Laureate, Professor Martha C. Nussbaum. Since none of the laureates are able to be present in Bergen for the celebrations, we have been forced to organize the events as digital events. Professor Pollock's Holberg Lecture will thus be given as a pre-recorded lecture from the University of Leeds, where she is located, while I am present in the University Aula in Bergen, from where the lecture will be streamed. <clears throat> Before we proceed with the Holberg Lecture, please bear with me as I introduce the 2020 Holberg Laureate. Griselda Pollock is Professor of Social and Critical Histories of Art and Director of Center for Cultural Analysis, Theory and History at the University of Leeds. She is a transdisciplinary scholar who works with cultural analysis of modernity and its traumas. Professor Pollock is a dedicated feminist art historian who critically examines the discipline of art history with the assistance of a wide range of cultural theory and multiple perspectives. Born in South Africa, where she spent critical years of her childhood, she also grew up in the Francophone and English Canada before migrating to Britain, where she completed her education. She studied modern history at the University of Oxford and did her PhD in history of art at the Courtauld Institute of Art, University of London. She has taught us at the universities of Reading, Manchester, and Leeds, where she has devoted uh, close to 50 years of her active and diverse teaching career, teaching art history, cultural studies, fine art, and feminist theory. In 1990, she became Professor of Social and Critical Histories of Art, stating with that title her commitment to a radical challenge to the discipline and to its pluralization. She co-founded an interdisciplinary center for cultural studies in 1985, a center for Jewish studies in 1995, focusing on visualities, and she is the founding director of the Transdisciplinary Center for Cultural Analysis, Theory, and History. In their citation, the Holberg Committee writes, Professor Griselda Pollock is, <coughs> excuse me, Professor Griselda Pollock is the foremost feminist art historian working in the world today. Since the 1970s, Pollock has been teaching and publishing in a field in which she is not only a renowned authority, but which she also helped create. In addition, she has exercised a profound influence on the development of feminist cinema studies, and she continues to be an inspirational figure, both inside and outside the academy. Pollock's early book, Old Mistresses, Women and Art and Ideology, from 1981, co-authored with Rotsika Parker, was a radical critique of art historical practice, the art canon and art museum curation. It has become a classic work of feminist art history. This pioneering spirit is also found in her monographs on such figures as Van Gogh in 1978, Mary Cassatt in 1980, and Charlotte Solomon from 2018. 
She has also written on women artists such as Eva Hesse, Louise Bourgeois, and Georgia O'Keeffe. Combining the expertise of traditional art historical scholarship with cutting edge theoretical sophistication. Pollock had, has made a substantial contribution to feminist film theory, and she has also been influential in film and trauma studies, notably with the book Concentrationary Cinema, which she edited with Max Silverman in 2011. Over a career in which she has produced more than 25 books and at least 200 articles and essays, Griselda Pollock has always upheld the highest level of scholarship while challenging received wisdom and institutional hierarchies of thought and value. For this, she has been a beacon for generations of art and cultural historians." End quote. <clears throat> With this introduction, let us make a virtual transition to Leeds and to Professor Pollock's 2020 Hober lecture entitled Art, Thought and Difficulty. Good day, whatever time that you are listening to this Holberg lecture that was to be given in 2020, but because of the pandemic, I am now giving it in 2021, and I am as honored to be offering this to you now as I was last summer. The title is Art, Thought and Difficulty. And in the abstract that I gave for this lecture, I offered the prefixes feminist, post-colonial, international, queer, social, for the histories of art. And I asked myself, are these merely labels I give myself that indicate all sorts of different kinds of ways of doing art history? Or are they, in fact, the obligations that I have, which are responding to the lived emergencies of our riven and still struggling world? Are they also roadmaps, perhaps, <clears throat> to transdisciplinary encounters in and with art's many histories? Are they incitements to thought? Are they sites of difficulty or of resistance or of transformation? Now, when I came, now that I'm in my 70s, to review what I had been doing as an art historian and cultural analyst for the last 50 years, I realized that my profile as an art historian did not conform to the normal. There are very few monographs. Yes, I've written about Mie, Mary Cassatt, Van Gogh, and Charlotte Zalaman. There are no period studies, you know, art in the 15th century, art in the 19th century. There are no thematic studies, uh, landscape or portraits or the nude. In fact, what marks my work out is the invention of concepts with which to think what in 1988 I conceptualized as feminist interventions in arts histories. That's to say, pluralizing the many histories to acknowledge that there isn't singly one single story of art, and that I am not simply a subset of art history, feminist as opposed to Renaissance, but I am intervening in art history from another space. And the concepts that I've used include Old Mistresses, which was inspired by Anne Gabhart and Elizabeth Brown's 1974 exhibition that said that there were no equivalent terms to Old Master, the reverential term for great artists of the past. When we say Old Mistresses, there's already a sense that language encodes what we then subtitled the book, Rosie Parker and myself, as women, art and ideology. There is vision and difference, framing feminism, avant-garde gambits, gender and the color of art history, generations and, and geographies, um, differencing the canon. And the most recent one is called the Virtual Feminist Museum. And the Virtual Feminist Museum is inspired in a way by the work of a Hamburg German Jewish art historian, Abi Warburg, who remained rather ignored in the 20th century until the beginning of the 21st century where he's become a great media star. And indeed in 2020, in the Haus der Welt called Kulturen der Welt, they installed the entire uh, legacy of, of Abi Warburg called the Memnosune, the Memory Builder Atlas, this atlas of images uh, which, of which 47 
um, canvases remain. And you can see they've created as a strange monumental um, environment in the ex exhibition. And they re-photographed all of his work from his huge collection of photographs. There's an interesting dis dis discussion there about art history and technology. But what he did was to mount on single canvases a range of images which had no necessary periodic or stylistic relationship. What they had in common is that they were examples of the pathos formel, the formula of affection or the formula of joy or ecstasy, depression, tragedy, of affects. And his argument, Warburg's argument, was that the image is a kind of carrier. It's a mnemonic. It's a memory of things people once actually did in fear and anxiety in their vulnerability before a world they did not control, which became encoded in gestures and rituals. And art derives from that, and in some sense, sense, the images become these rather like batteries. They store up the powerful emotional or affective energy in gestures and in the movement of accessories. And it was by this means that Barburg was able to study what he called the, the migration of images across many cultures, a kind of deep consistency of this affective psychic life of the, of the image and of human culture, and at the same time to explain the inexplicable. How was it that in the middle of the great Middle Ages and the end of the Middle Ages, as we see them now, of the Christian world, the Christian culture reached back and adopted the pagan culture of the images of the classical world? Now, Warburg was witnessing in his lifetime the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of fascism, and in his um, image uh, atlas, he brought together images that came from newspapers, from prints, from drawings, from coins, from enamels, from jewelry, from sculpture and painting. And in this particular one I'm showing you, he not only is referring to a Raphael painting that I've highlighted, uh, subject to one of my recent lectures, but also witnessing the signing of the pact between the Vatican and Mussolini, which finally seceded Vatican secular political leadership to the fascist state. And he witnessed this and included it as part of his analysis of what is the deep unconscious of culture that is revealed. Another reference that I use is the idea that art works. Now, obviously, images also, from the social historian's point of view, have um, ideology. They have ideologies, material, class, race, gender ideologies. But in the terms of one of my other great teachers, Tim Clark, T.J. Clark, who wrote in 1973 that although all artworks have ideology as their materials, the actual process, the making, the painting or the sculptural, uh, works that material and requires very careful and detailed reading in order to understand precisely how the issues are entangled and indeed formulated, given a form, but not a pure form, but a formulation which enables this multiple memories to play. And so the word artworking I want to introduce comes from an artist on whom I've written and whose theories on I've written about, um, a major theorist and artist, Bracher Lichtenberg Ettinger, who coined the phrase artworking to understand how the aesthetic is a particular form of this transformation that Warburg began to trace in images. And this draws on the economic model from Freud, dream work, working through the work of mourning, which were all created in the, cult, the moment at which he moved from a cathartic model of the psyche to an economic model of the psyche. It worked, it transformed. But he did this in the midst of the first industrial world war. Bracher Lichtenberg Ettinger is a child of the second world war, formed in a world is the aftermath of the industrial genocide that occurred under the umbrella, but separate from the Second Industrial World War in 1939 to 45. And she is in what we call a post-traumatic painter. Um, and I want to bring this into the way that I understand the Virtual Feminist Museum. These are assemblages where I use the notion of the museum as a kind of form of archive and a cultural memory. And I, like Warburg, assemble a range of images that talk to each other to reveal something of a different kind of unconscious. In the encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum, I was particularly tracking the issues of modernity, femininity, and representation across the 20th century. 
But in the second installation in the Virtual Feminist Museum, After Affects, After Images, Trauma and Aesthetic Transformation in the Virtual Feminist Museum, I was engaging precisely with the catastrophic nature of the 20th century, issues of migration, of exile, of the loss of home and language, issues of genocide, issues of mortality, premature and other kinds of encounters with death, uh, in which uh, I drew very much upon Bracha Ettinger's work and wrote about it in the Virtual Feminist Museum. There are two further installations in the making. One is called Raphael after the Holocaust and the third one is what I wrote when I should have been writing my Hol Hol Holberg lecture last year, which is a book in which there's a new concept, Killing Men and Dying Women, which focuses on painting in New York in the 1950s. But the lecture today is really about this photograph which is of, let us just describe it, it's a beach scene. We are at the seaside, some people are dabbling in the sea. On the left is a mother and child sitting on the sand. To the right is another woman and two children also sitting on the sand. But what is remarkable about this image is that it is, seems just a holiday snap. And you will probably guess it's one of mine. But I want to put that in context because we now understand photography as Warburg began to do it in terms of the image, as itself a kind of transmitter of memory and also a site, a political site, a sentimental site, an ideological site. It was Jo Spence, the British working class white woman artist, who first drew attention to that in 79 with her examination of her classed family album, the piece called Beyond the Family Album. We also know that the next year, Roland Barthes, the French glittery theorist, would himself explore the issues of photography, placing at the center of his book, La Chambre Claire, or Camera Lucida, a photograph of his mother before he was born, that he mused upon as he mourned the mother who had lived with him all his life. And then in 1980, Julia, not Mariana, Julia Hirsch, who was a photographic theorist, wrote a book called Family Photographs, in which she wrote, Lumps of experience, rites of passage, um, grains of po poignancy and promise, all of these um, turn us into artists sorting through life in search of images and events, which our cameras will turn into symbols and allegories. The sleeping child, the fleshy mother, the tired father, the testy siblings can, in the quick eye of the camera, be transformed into images of innocence, protectiveness, enterprise and sharing. Family photography is not only an accessory to our deepest longings and regrets, it is also a part of the visual rules that shape our experience and our memory. So I want to draw upon this in order to uh, look at the legacy of the family album. In my most recent and most monumental monograph about the German-Jewish artist Charlotte Zalman, 1917 to 1943, I assembled the fragments of a shattered family's family album. We have a little girl sitting alone, no mother present. We have a little girl slightly older with a father. We have a girl with an, um, a nanny. We have a girl dressed up for probably a Purim party with her father. We then have a passport photograph that she had to get in order to escape Germany in 1933. There she is in exile with her grandparents in the sunny south of France, where she returns to her painting and dedicates herself to it. To live there she has to have a permit and there is a photograph which gives her temporary residence in uh, the area of Nice. Now, all of these images can be identified in this way, but they're also, therefore, a political inscription of mourning, a ruined childhood, a lonely childhood, um, forced exile, um, migration, art, and indeed the insinuations of institutional power and potentially the forces that would destroy her in 1943. And when we look outside her house in Wielenstrasse in Charlottenburg in Berlin, we find the sad tale of that life that was abbreviated because there are no photographs after the woman in her late, her mid-twenties. This, as it were, strikes into the family album what this Stolperstein, this memorial stone, says that she 
fled to, to, to France in 1938, in fact. She may have been in a concentration camp, it's still di disputed. She was definitely deported, denounced, deported to Trancy, deported in 1943, and mur murdered in Auschwitz the day of her arrival on the 10th of October that year. So when we come to this image, although I see it as a sentimental image in the family album, I see it also as a very political image, one that deserves a political reading, and also as an image, a pathos formula, in the sense that I have used it. It actually was taken on St Michael's Sandy Beach in the province that was then called Natal and now in liberated South Africa. It's called KwaZulu Natal, and I think it was taken in August 1950. The beach is a very famous summer holiday. It's on the southern coast, southern east coast of, of um, Africa, South Africa. And if you read the names of some of the um, beaches there, Ramsgate, Margate, Trafalgar, as well as I thought Oslo was quite nice for the fact that this is a lecture um, associated with, with Norway. Uh, these are the what, what Gayatri Spivak would have called the welding, the sites of the welding, the colonial welding of this space. And in this space, of course, this is um, a, a political space. It's a political space which we must go through. So first of all, I notice the ramrod straight back of a toddler with a pudding basin haircut. Um, she's wearing a jersey. This is August in the Southern Hemisphere, so it was keeping her cool. And it may be, I think, I've said a she, a little girl. Then we have the fact that this whole height of this child reaches only to the head of the woman beside her, leaning are uh, stretched out on the beach, we can't see her body, but leaning on her hand to watch what the child's doing. We cannot see what that is, but it's caught her attention. We therefore have a mother and child dyad, a very sentimental image, very touching. But then the wide-angled lens of the photographer, who probably intended to photograph his wife, his child, for those certain reasons, managed to capture in the view some another family, or is it a family? No, it is a black woman dressed, an African woman, dressed in the uniform required, black and white, of those who work for white people. She is looking after two white children. They can play on the beach, her children cannot. They can swim on the beach, as my mother obviously has in this picture, and I now reveal that this is my mother and myself as a child, but she cannot. People of colour, Africans, had to go to a different beach, a stony beach, that was uh, removed. But this is an image, therefore, that contains within it that history of South Africa. 1950, it is two years after the official statement of the apartheid legislation that absolutely segregated South Africa on grounds of race. But the interesting thing about this woman is that she is looking back at the invisible photographer, probably a man, probably a father, that's what men did, they had cameras and the know-how then. But she's been arrested from her charge and looking and curious as indeed is the little boy with her. Now it is her look which now is endlessly inscribed as looking at me as I look at the photograph. What is it to see this woman? Well we can't see her because the, the technology of, or the as it were, calibration of photography to register the full details of white skin never registers without other calibration the distinction of the features of a black woman and therefore she is rendered almost invisible even as her pose makes her clearly engaged in curiosity and looking. But in fact these children are not hers, she probably is a mother, the children of her body are probably a thousand kilometers away, she probably only sees them once a year and she is now in a figure of proletarian labour. She is a, a servant, a nanny, caring for white children. So when we put this image back together again, I have two, fo two focuses. One, which is personal and individual, on the little scene on the left. And the, on the right, I am arrested by this look, called upon as an obligation to think, who is this woman, what is her life, and what is she seeing? Is she seeing apartheid? And is apartheid a crime? Is the obligation to speak of that photograph part of my obligation to address a crime? And the major crime uh, is apartheid. But in 2020, the, I read a report of the quarrel that had broken out because the former, um, the last 
white South African premier of the um, apartheid South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, was arguing that although he accepted apartheid was a crime and for which he apologized and he apologized for his own role in it, he did not think it was to be calculated in the same categories of the crimes against humanity and particularly those that caused millions of deaths through genocide. But if we listen to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and all the subsequent testimonies that come out, he cannot deny that many people did not die. Many people did die in horrific circumstances by secret police. They were thrown from windows from, in police custody. They were murdered in a variety of ways, both purposeful and secret. And so we are in the realm of the crime against humanity, and we have to ask what that is. Now, Pumla Godobo, um, Gobodo Matsikisela, um, a beautiful name, um, wrote a book called A Human Being Died That Night because she went and after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and interviewed Eugene de, Klerk, who, de Kock, who was one of the commanders of a, um, a very brutal and secret unit that uh, killed many, many of the apartheid activists or anti-apartheid activists. And he was tried and sentenced to 212 years in prison for committing six murders. And the book, A Human Being Died That Night, is um, Pumla's study of the question of what does such atrocity that you perform do to you as a human being, even as you affect the deaths of many others. So let me come back now once again to my beach scene with the sense that there is also a crime inscribed in this uh, photograph casually taken in 1950. Now, I first dared to, as it were, cross the line between academic and personal in a, uh, a conference paper that I gave at a conference on travellers' tales, on uh, narratives of, um, of home and displacement. And I wrote a piece called Territories of Desire, Reconsiderations of an African Childhood. And I dedicated it to a woman whose name was not Julia. Julia was the woman like that one on the beach who cared for me when my mother wasn't with me. Julia was the companion of my first five years of my life, the centre of my affection, who cared for me on a daily basis. But I did not know her first name, her given name. I never knew her family name. I have never been able to trace her or any of her family because to save the European tongue, uh, the servants were given European names like Julia. Now, in this essay, I was exploring the question of how living in a racialized society racializes the white person. And I borrowed from Freud's notion of the sexuation through the Oedipal Triangle, which is composed of the mother, father, and the child, who must turn into um, a, an identify, a boy who identifies with the father, or a girl who realizes that she is lacking. And I've turned it into a racial triangle in which you have the, 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 the white and mother and father, the figures of, of privilege, the black nanny, deprived of her motherhood in many cases, and the child who will be whitened, whether she's a girl or a boy, because she will align or he will align with the freedom and privilege of the white mother and father over what they see is the abjection and powerlessness even of the figure who was their intimate uh, carer and gave the, and even in a situation of such horror, ethically inclined, as um, Adriana Cavarera would say, to care for the vulnerable. So this became a theory of how in uh, societies, colonial societies and slave-owning societies, you actually race the children. How do you produce a white psyche through these particular relations? in which you then abject, just as we abject the mother, we abject the white carer. So I want to take up the pathos formula of the relation of these two women in time and history that we find together on the beach in St. Michael's in Natal. I took this further because I also located my, photo my photograph in relation to other travelers, because my family were migrants. My parents had arrived in South Africa in 1947, a colonial outpost and now an independent country that enabled them to have professional jobs which would give them holidays on the beach with golf courses and the money to pay nannies to look after their children. So there's a kind of class structure in this colonial system. But in my 
lecture that I gave to honor of Walter Neurath in 1993 called Avant-Garde Gambits, subtitled Gender and the Color of Art History, I dared to, to breach a certain kind of um, legacy because I joined my family's colonial travels to that of a famous artist, another colonial tourist who went to Tahiti, which was by the mid-19th century French Polynesia. And that is Paul Gauguin. And this is the painting I was most interested in, a painting called Manao to Pau Pau, which apparently translates as the spirit of the dead watching. We see a naked brown-skinned woman lying on a bed and she is seen from behind. She looks towards the space of the viewer in certain kind of terror, we are told, while behind her a strange and uncanny figure, all dressed in black, looks blankly across the canvas. In my research, I wanted to name this body on the thing, not just a black body. Her name is Taha Hamana, and she was 13 years old when Gauguin, under Tahitian law and custom, bought or married this young woman so that she would be the one to get him food, foraging in the forest for breadfruit, and keep his house and be his bed companion. But strangely, he paints her in two other cases. He gives us, we've got three portraits of her that you see at the bottom. She is wearing Christian clothes. This is what the missionaries, these kind of mumus the missionaries imposed on otherwise bare-breasted Tahitian uh, Polynesian women. But in, next to the painting at the top, you will see a notebook where he draws her very blackened in that very pose in his travel journals. But he also draws a version of this painting in the Cahier pour Aline, a notebook he created for his 17-year-old daughter Aline, or age 16, in 1893. What would it mean for Aline as a 16-year-old to receive an image thus of the other wife? Aline was in Denmark with Gauguin's strange Danish wife, and now he's to be given an image uh, in a very provocative sexual pose of apparently a terrified but naked young woman who is her father's companion. Gauguin infected Tahahamana with the syphilis he carried. Uh, she, he, he left her when he, in 1893, she went off, she married somebody else, but died, interestingly, um, tragically, in 1918 from the last great pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic that killed 25% of the Tahitian population. She did infect Gauguin and her son with the, the, the disease. Now, the book uh, Avant-Garde Gambits is about what makes the avant-garde in the, in the West work? The avant-garde involves a th game, a game called reference, deference and difference. That's to say each artist makes a kind of play, and particularly in the modern moment, to kind of interrupt the Western translate, uh, tradition, to make a move that simply shifts the very terms. And Edouard Manet is one of those who did that with the painting Olympia, 1863, which you see on the left part of the screen. Uh, what he did was to take the erotic and indeed a marital nude that had been created in the 16th century by Venetian artists like Titian and Giorgione and he make it prostitutionalizes it. This is clearly a prostitute offering herself and at the same time he proletarianizes it. Both the question of sexuality is there, but also he's showing us the kind of skinny teenagers that I used to see around Leeds uh, many years ago on the streets, people driven to drugs or for, uh, for drugs or for poverty to sell themselves. Undernourished, she is not the exotic fantasy of the luscious female body, and she sits on her bed attended with a black woman. So we have another pair of a black and a white woman. And it is Gauguin who is playing this game, because when his painting Manau to Papau was shown in Paris in 1893, the critics called it the Brown Olympia. So they saw in colour. But in a way, the uh, argument that I, I would want to develop here is that there is something in the way that Manet works, both the uh, um, convention that he's working with and also another convention which is the one that Gauguin does not work. So Gauguin is referencing Manet, a woman on a bed, two figures, a black and a, and a different one. He is uh, referencing it, he's deferring to Manet's achievement, but he's making his move, and his move is to colonialize it. 
Whereas Manet actually uh, had, was a decolonializing artist, I would suggest. The woman in the, in the um, Olympia, we know her name. I also found with my research assistant, Nancy Proctor, we found the birth certificate for this woman whose name is Laura, Laura in French. And she had been found, interestingly enough, in the Jard Jardin des Tuileries, in the gardens of the Tuileries, working as a nanny for a white family. So she obviously uh, repeats my certain kind of colonial structure of domestic servitude. But at least Manet portrayed her um, as a, an individual, even though it's never given her, wasn't given her name. And you can see her presence in this painting is as a proletarian because she's not naked. She's got a head wrap, of course, that marks her Africanness, but she's wearing a second-hand clothes typical of the what working class people did was to buy second-hand clothes in the markets. It's a Western dress. And we find possibly this woman in another situation by a younger artist around Manet, Frederick Basile, who also painted uh, a woman similarly dressed. But in two paintings on the left, we have this other element of the um, use of a black woman, as in this is in a, a late, uh, early 19th century painting by a woman, Marie Guillaume Benoit, um, of something simply called La Negresse, who was a servant and a slave in her family's household. Or we have the African woman always as the attendant on the bright white female nude. This combination we see in a range of Orientalist paintings, a term we learnt from Edward Said about a representation of the East and of Africa, but I would argue that in fact what Manet did, and I have argued this, deorientalized this by the, both the overt prostitutionalization, bringing in the commerce, the crescents of class, but also by the proletarianization of both these images who become an economic partnership running a business that includes selling sex. Now, when we go back to this image, there is a gloss of, ero of, exotic, of eroticism, but also a gloss of exoticism, as if this is young, some young superstitious child. But I want to take up the fact she's 13 and take you on another direction, and that is to introduce a character called Pierre Lotti. This is the nom de plume of a French naval officer who became a writer, who traveled when Japan opened up to Japan. Japan opens up in um, 1854 with Commander Perry's first contact and the French go there and in the Mariage de Lotti and his little novel Madame Crisantem he talks about the fact that he too found a young teenager to marry under Japanese customs for the duration of his stay. Now his novels were read by Gauguin and he inspired, that partly inspired his trip to, to Tahiti and also by Van Gogh who was so enthralled that he painted his version of an ideal 13, 14 year old called Amusme that he, had he been in, in really in Japan, would have sought to marry. And of course this is all going to inspire Giacomo Puccini who will take up a different version of the story in his um, uh, opera Madame a Butterfly uh, which first was performed in 1904. Now, I'm going to shift tone suddenly for a moment because the question of opera comes in and it will come in, uh, it's important in several ways in my lecture. The issue of opera is this, which is operas tend to kill women. Very few women survive to the end of an opera apart from Mozart, thankfully. It's one of those games we can play, which heroine doesn't get, doesn't get to die. And in her anthropologist Catherine Clément's book called Opera and the Undoing of Women, she points us to these plots, these endless plots in which the whole argument of the, of, of, or the plot of the, the, the opera is one that leads us to be witness to a death. But the question of opera, like all art, is how does it do that? What is the pathos formula in opera? It's not the plot, it's the embodied performance of the singer, it's the voice and music, and it is indeed duration. We have to endure it. It goes on, and the aria goes on, and we are listening in a kind of prolonged way to the voices of women. When I discussed with Lubaina Himid about opera, and we'll come to the artist Lubaina Himid shortly, I was thrilled to discover that she too had a passion for opera. And she listened to it for two reasons. One is, operas give us conversations between women, 
beautiful entangled voices, sopranos and alto sopranos and mezzo sopranos. And what are they doing? In their conversations, they are trying to work out what to do. Lubaina Himid argues that, we are, that women, even in, in the struggle of working out what to do, there's a certain gloriousness, a certain reparation that we get, even as they negotiate worlds which close doors with death as the only solution. And I would like now to uh, play you some from um, the end of um, the Royal Opera House's recent performance of um, production of this Because what I think we are going to watch, in a sense, is not just as spectators. I'm going to let this moment go. But we are called upon to be witnesses to what these stories and their encoded social and ideological frameworks deliver to us and demand of the plot. A woman like this cannot be allowed to survive with her mixed race child. The white uh, naval officer comes back to collect the child with his white wife, his real wife, while a woman who has believed in love is going to be abandoned and finds herself finding no other way to live in honor but to kill herself because of the dishonor that has been done. So this is a way in which I'm using Puccini to give a voice to the black mother on the beach deprived of her children. So when we line up this on my um, new builder atlas, Manet and Gauguin, we need to also link the two to even South Pacific. It enters popular culture and I'm not going to play this, but there is um, a, a, a version of the famous song, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught, where two men who have loved Tahitian women and under the rules of American culture and the forbidding of miscegenation as a kind of horror, a transgression, 
they sing rather bitterly, you've got to be carefully taught to hate. I recommend you watch that. And now we're going to jump to another beach, to the beach created by Lubaina Himid, who was born on an island, Zanzibar, in 1954 and lives in Britain. Here we have again two women, but now we have two black women. It's called Freedom and Change, 1984, and is now in the London Tate Gallery. On the right, you can see the scale of the image. It's monumental. Two women run across a beach on the central panel. Behind them are, in cut-out form, the heads of white men buried in the sand, and the women, one woman carries in her hand the reins of the dogs of war that she might lo soon let loose. But this is a conversation of a different kind, not reference, deference and difference, as we saw with Gauguin's competitive relationship to Manet, but reference, deference and defiance, because the image she is overwriting is Picasso, is Pablo Picasso's image of two women on the beach of 1922, where he draws upon a certain kind of monumentalism drawn from non-European artistic traditions um, in order to um, celebrate the kind of return to order, the classicism of which he became such a figure in the 1920s. Lubaina Himid clothes the women in, clo in cloth, in textures, in collages, which becomes one of her major languages. But this allows me a little rabbit hole to another monumental figure that Picasso painted back in 1907 when he did a portrait of the most important cubist of all, the great Jewish lesbian writer Gertrude Stein. In over 80 sittings, he struggled to find a way to give her a face, to find, as many scholars have argued, how to portray all those identities and give them a form. What is the pathos formula for such a figure? the intellectual woman, the Jewish lesbian, the lesbian intellectual, the greatest cubist. And ultimately he borrowed from archaic lecture, from prehistoric Iberian uh, art forms that he'd studied uh, in a summer holiday in Spain, which he would then also imprint on his own features in the self-portrait he committed, he, he created at the same time. Just as he was painting Gertrude Stein, he's conceiving the next move in the game of, of reference, deference and difference in the history of the, the nude and the modern nude and the pro proletarianized nude and the exoticized nude with the magnificent and horrifying um, Demoiselle d'Avignon. Definitely a, a brothel scene, we understand. Um, it's painted in June, July 1907, and we can trace a certain kind of continuity down the side screen from Delacroix's Women of Algiers to Olympia to Ang's Turkish Bath to, to Gauguin's um, uh, Manar to Pau Pau. And this remarkable painting uh, draws not only on this new language that he's creating out of his borrowings from pre Iberian. Um, uh, Spanish and indeed African culture, but also at the same time he is registering the absolute com complexity of a man driven by great sexual desire in an era in which a certain kind of sexuality is associated with death because he lived in an era before penicillin took control of syphilis. But let's follow the two women from Lubaina's Hibbert to another series of her works um, called, in a sequence called Revenge, where she explores the issue of painting two women. At first she painted several white women and black women in paintings with others, but no one saw them, so she decided that she really had to create this. But now we are in the world of two women, not on the beach, but at their dining room table. And they are... Um, engaged in debate. This is, as it were, an operatic conversation going on. What are we to do with the world? We see the carcass of a continent of Africa that has been made the dark continent on one side. We see the challenge to the Euro-American uh, and EU as at time hegemony on the right-hand side. In another one, we see the two companions 
going across the Black Atlantic, throwing away the maps and navigation charts that brought the Europeans to buy enslaved Africans and transport them in horrific terms to their colonies. You see them going to the theatre, maybe having had a conversation with Mary Cassatt, the Impressionist, or maybe Jeanne Duval, or maybe even Laure. They met her, and as they look at the blank space of from the theatre box, what are they being given in this culture of Europe uh, as women of Africa to see? But there is another conversation going on, another kind of reference, deference and difference going on here in which uh, this is actually a rather autobiographical scene. The, paint, the person on the left can be identified with Maud Salter, a Ghanaian Scottish poet and artist who was the companion of Lubaina Himid for many years. And she is, as it were, dressed in the style of the 1920s, evoking for me another figure. Someone comes into view, which is Josephine Baker. Uh, remarkable as the, one of the most extraordinary, beautiful dancers uh, and decolonizing dancers, even as she was required to perform with the banana skirt, who became one of the most glamorous singers across Europe in the 1920s, owned a cabaret, sometimes cross-dressed, turned into the 1950s a very famous performer, was a freedom fighter working for, um, the, um, in, the, in the Second World War, and also became the mother of the Rainbow Tribe, in which she adopted children from every country of the world and every community that she could find, and drew them, raised them together in love and affection, so that they would never ever misrecognize anyone as not like themselves. But on the other side of the table, we have Lubaina Himid, which we can recognize here from a later photograph. She's using her features, but also she's dressed in the coat of Gertrude Stein. She's bringing back another set of images, and the painting is an evocation of one of the great iconic images of the lesbian partnership of Alice B. Toklas and Gertrude Stein in what is the first modern museum of French art. Uh, as they sit here, this is Man Ray's. But I am fascinated with the pathos formula, in a sense, how do you formulate an image for two women, which does not reproduce the notion of the couple, sort of Mr. Stein and Mrs. Toklas, as it were, as you see in Man Ray's sort of creation of the couple round their fireplace. How do you create equality? And that's what I see in the queer photographer Cecil Beaton, who tried um, to find in the 1930s a way to represent this very long and extraordinary partnership, and finally set them up face to face, uh, unequal formats, a, a, you know, without any accoutrements of the, the conventional notions of the couple. One more beach we're going to. Lubaina uh, grew up, obviously, uh, in Britain, uh, severed from the natal memory of her original home. And I've created a concept called natal memory, which is the memory of uh, those first things you open your eyes to as a child, what you first see, what you first smell, the music you first hear, the things that you find around us, creates an indelible, um, as it were, home image that even if, as I was, was a transitory, born into a country and then became a, a migrant to two other countries, this is always, as it were, the landscape and the sounds and the look of places that touch me more deeply than any other. And in her later life, she created a series first called Beach Houses in 1995, where we have a series of strange structures set in darkness or under th storm clouds or at dawn or as if on a kind of the red planet. They look like kind of creatures almost reaching out into the sea. They are strange and lonely structures. Um, points of connection, but also points of solitude and isolation, watching the beaches. And of course, in any artist of African descent, the beach is always the beach of departure, whether it's for migration or from that which millions and millions of Africans were taken into enslavement, not only across the Black Atlantic that Paul Gilroy talks about, but indeed across the Indian Ocean as well. She finally goes to Zanzibar, and here we have the fourth journey, was a painting of a series uh, that she says was itself an exercise in speed, calm and panic. I listened to a great deal of music, a combination of whatever Radio 3 offered, which is the classical music program, and a careful selection of CDs, mostly of women singing. I think she's listening to Norma, trying to remember and to soothe. These are paintings of clothes, of rain, of closed shutters. These are paintings of the sea, of fishing nets, 
of death from malaria. Her father died when she was a baby from that disease. And of course, women's tears. So we're back again to a certain theme of mourning. And when we have memory work, it's sometimes political memory work and also the work of personal mourning. And for whom are we mourning, as indeed I am with this photograph. In the early 90s, another example of daring to transgress the divisions between the theoretical and the personal was on the occasion of a conference celebrating Elizabeth Bronfen's brilliant book over her dead body, um, Death, Femininity and the Aesthetic. Going back, of course, to opera, why is it, in a sense, that death of women is so much part of our cultural heritage? It's celebrated in, in drama, it's celebrated in opera, it's the condition of detective movies and so many other films. And so I made a film called Deadly Tales. Um, I first delivered it at a performance lecture, then I made a film of it, and then I exhibited it in different ways as an installation. It was conceived in one sitting in seven parts, like a Jewish menorah celebrating the six days of creation and the sixth day of rest. But my, six, my seventh part in the centre was in fact a void, a void of losses. So we have a painting of uh, the morning painting representing the ideas of social death and pr private death from the 16th century. We have a reference to the death of uh, Walter Benjamin that abruptly ended a brilliant intellectual career. We have the unmourned and unknown private death of my father-in-law, the sole survivor of his family. His parents, elderly people, were taken from Theresienstadt and brutally murdered in Auschwitz in December 1943. And then we have more theoretical companions of this framing. We have Roland Barthes once again, and my question was, why is his mother a public property, a cultural icon, why is my mother just my private grief? And then we have Sigmund Freud, whose theory of the, psy the psyche uh, failed to understand the significance of the mother-child bond, and indeed of the significance of the mother at all, casting her into a kind of status of being a, a, a gestating body, a caring set of arms, and then in a sense displaced by the power of the father. And then finally, I have a play by Tom Scott Stoppard called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And I just want to play the last bit of this film um, for you. But we have deaths for all occasions and ages. Deaths by suspension, deaths by convulsion, consumption, incision, execution, asphyxiation, malnutrition. Climactic carnage we can do, poison, steel, double deaths by duel, Show, show it all. Come on, let's show it. Guildenstern, tired, drained, but still on the edge of impatience, over the mind. No! No, not for us. It's not like that. Dying isn't romantic. And death is not a game which will soon be over. Death is not anything. Death is not. It's the absence of presence, nothing more. It's the endless time of never coming back. A gap you can't see. And when the wind blows through it, it makes no sound.
And now I want to turn once again to the beach where I'm going to end, but before I do that I need to introduce you to Santu Mofeking, um, a South African uh, photographer born in 1956, tragically died very young in 2020, who became a photographer through working in, in newspapers and then did a wonderful thing called the Black Family Album, which was to assemble photographs of the black middle class in South Africa uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century before the British colonial government dispossessed them of the right to own any property, proletarianizing them entirely. And this image of a different world of South Africans uh, was a very important project. But he also created a wonderful project of landscape photography called Chasing Shadows, which I encountered. And in one of these pieces, it takes us back to the question of the crime. Was apartheid a crime? Does it count in the relation to the concentration? So this is one of the photographs in that book, and it's actually made me immediately think that I was looking probably at the cell on Robin Island, uh, just off the coast of Cape Town, in which Nelson Mandela was confined for 27 years. But then I discovered, and where he had to work as a stonebreaker in the blazing heat as part of this imprisonment. But in fact, it's not Robin Island, it's in fact this camp, Ravensbrück, which was opened in May 1939. The majority of its 132,000 inmates in this concentration camp over the next six years were um, British, Soviet, German women, a smaller contingent of French and Jewish women that formed a 20% minority and a tiny number of Jehovah's Witnesses who were incarcerated there. 117,000 prisoners died in the course of a regime of slave labor, of brutality, torture and experimentation and ultimately starvation. Now, I was in fact studying Ravensbrück because I was tracing the writers of inmates like Germain Tillion, Charlotte Delbo, and Genevieve de Gaulle, um, Antonie who all of whom gave us um, political analyses and personal memoirs of their experience of the concentrationary universe. Now, this relates to my long-term research project from 2007 to 2020 on concentrationary memories, the politics of representation. And concentrationary memories is another of my concepts. I did this with my dear colleague, Max Silverman, and in the course of our research, we have produced four books, Study of Concentrationary Cinema, Alain René's Night and Fog, The Concept of Concentrationary Memories, The Concentrationary Imaginaries, the way in which the concentrationary has infil infiltrated and shaped popular culture and cinema, and finally, Concentrationary Art, what kind of art can bring us to be vigilant in our memory of totalitarianism? And the point of the concentrationary is this is not the exterminationary. Extermination of the Roma and European uh, Jewish, um, the Roma and Jewish Europeans took place in three or four isolated camps between 42 or 41, 42 and 43 with the exception of Auschwitz-Birkenau, which carried on until 1944. Uh, these were hidden in Poland. These were never seen by the, the, the Allies when they liberated what they liberated. And where we have photographs of Bergen-Belsen and Dachau and Buchenwald are the concentration camps, of which there were 10,000 by 1945, with a population of about three quarters of a million people. And it was in the literature created by the de political uh, deportees who were prisoners in these concentration camps that the concept that the camp was a system, not just a hidden place for mass destruction, but a place that people lived for up to 10 years if they could survive it. But it was part of the system that created totalitarianism, created a totalitarian terror, which eviscerated, politically eviscerated the societies in which it was the instrument. And the core text is by a, a French political deportee, David Rousset, who returned, as you can see, a very skeletal figure on the left to become his natural plump self later. And his writing, along with others, political anatomies of the concentrationary system were the foundations for Hannah uh, Arendt's exploration of the nature of evil in the 20th century and her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which the 
uh, last section of that book on totalitarianism is very much drawn on the idea of what the camp does. The camp is a systematic destruction of the human condition. The human condition is that that you are yourself, not just a nameless number, that you have the capacity for spontaneous action and that the actions you do belong to and constitute the plurality of the human condition. What the camps do is systematically erode that to what the person is in the camp is simply trying to keep living a process of moral death, of social death and ultimately your body is going to die. And so when I went back to Santu Moffaking's photographs, I was fascinated to think of this South African post-apartheid, South African photographer, or photo photographer in the post-apartheid time, traveling in Europe and visiting the sites, seeing the relations here in this photograph between terror and bureaucracy, which would be such a crucial part of Hannah Arendt's analysis. Seeing, uh, as it were, the sort of the camp space, the, the closed space, the place set apart, seeing then and being present in, uh, at the railway lines and seeing the railway lines which now you look out from your posh hotels when you book to go and make a visit to Auschwitz. But then he will go also to see the, one, the, the, the railway lines that have no two-way traffic. You go and it's a one-way entry and that is life, or that is death. And again, the field of the concentration universe is the barbed wire camp. And yet, he also then goes and makes these idyllic landscape photographs until you realise in the caption that this is where the ashes of those cremated were dumped when they could no longer find places to take them else. And then this amazing photograph of himself, in a way a self-portrait at Auschwitz I. What I've been showing you mostly is Auschwitz II, the, the extermination camp. Auschwitz I is a concentration camp does have a crematorium, but here it, now it is the tourist bait. This is the, the, the site of the Auschwitz Museum. And in this extraordinary photograph in which Santu Moffaking photographs himself and photographs in a sense a reflection uh, in the window of the building he's looking out from, which then creates the building that he sh is looking in as a backdrop, projected onto the landscape, he significantly becomes, as it were, a stain in the landscape, a black stain. You can see the head, you can see the shoulder, you can see the hand holding it. He is, in a sense, both present and absent, but makes himself literally a stain marked in this space. Now, is it in some sense this image suggesting a correlation between the concentrationary universe of the Third Reich uh, and the dictatorships that Elaborate, you know, it's proliferated all across Latin America in the legacy of this novelty that, that the Third Reich and Stalin invented in their own different ways. Is he making a, relation, a relationship or a collect connection to South Africa? Was South Africa in some sense a concentrationary society? Does it need a concentrationary memory? Uh, were there concentrationary imaginaries and what is the art concentrationary art? So now I come back finally to the beach, to the end of this lecture, in which I wish to give that silent woman gazing on the beach a voice in the person of two women, Joyce Siroke and Ellen Cosueo. Ellen Cosueo was a teacher, a social worker, a magnificent uh, apartheid fighter uh, throughout her life, who ended her life in the age of 80 uh, with as being um, a p member of parliament. And they were... Uh, Joyce and Ellen were the great strugglers and they made a film together with a white Jewish woman, Betty Volpert, uh, and I'm now going to play this scene, but if you can imagine and sense behind this image I'm showing you the freedom and change women of Lubaina Himid and then multiplying the women on the beach, not just a white, a white woman and a black woman isolated as they were in my family photograph, but in a political collaboration in the struggle against inhumanity and a struggle for the human condition. So now I want to play this and I want to give the women the last word. In the early 1980s, we made a film called Mamaram Crying, telling the story of apartheid. 
In those years of oppression, South Africa was filled with fear and despair. And yet we witnessed the amazing courage of the people. Now that a veil has been lifted off the heart of a nation, I am returning to this land of my birth to revisit the people we filmed during those years and to discover how they feel in the new South Africa. Ellen Kuswire and Joyce Soroki led me through this journey. In those fearful years, they were both in prison for their stand against apartheid. We were so excited this year when Ellen, at the age of 80, became a member of parliament after a lifetime of being denied the vote. There's the flag. That's right. Uh, you know, and when it started, I wondered whether this flag Many things go through one's mind. And you say, is it true? Is it me? And it's me. And you only finally say, it's history. I keep on saying, I could have come earlier. I could have made a better contribution much earlier. And yet at the same time I say, I don't think I'm here by mistake. I'm here to fulfill the demands of history. As I see the Union Jack being lowered over the smart colonial hotel and hear the sound of the last post, I know that last post will soon echo around this land signaling the end of our domination over a once patient people. On those rare occasions when we went to the sea on holiday, I remember always feeling humiliated when I read the hateful signs reserved for whites only. We would sometimes dare to step from our stony beach onto their nice sandy one, but always with the fear of being arrested by the police who constantly patrolled to keep us in our place. Remember on the beach, Ellen? Do you remember? On this beach, you, me and Joyce sitting right. quietly, right. newly multiracial, just beginning to integrate, and this young white man came. Do you remember him? towering over. I thought he was coming to be friendly. Mm -hmm. And he looked down and looked at the two of you and said, welcome, welcome to the human race. You can imagine. Welcome to the human race. race. Wow. And indeed, when you look at it, you say, who are human? Who are? You know, you don't want to be saying, I'm better than so and so. But the truth of the matter is that the fact that in all ethnic black communities of South Africa, we have been brought up on one thing, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, humanity. To us, a person is more important than anything else, regardless of the color of their skin. And when you hear somebody coming to say, welcome to the human race when indeed she is degrading you you can only but sympathize with that type of person well those he said that because those days whites regarded us as baboons yes, in fact they even called us baboons Absolutely. they said and they come from the trees yes exactly. and they didn't think we were human but they didn't realize betty and ellen that in the process of dehumanizing us, 
through their gruesome acts of apartheid, the detentions, mm. the banishments, the torture, and, the, and forcing the people into exile and removing mm. people from their land. In that process, they were also dehumanizing yes. themselves. Exactly. They were trapped in their hatred and in fact imprisoned in their hatred. You are so right, Joyce. You couldn't have given a better description of that situation. Mm. Indeed, imprisoned in their hatred. So I wanted to give a voice to the black woman on the beach that is iconized for me as a memory that I do not own from my family album. I've let them have the last word. But I hope what I've demonstrated is that being one element of the creation of a feminist history of, involved, of art involved dissolving one aspect of that term, the challenge, the discourses that constitute art history as a discipline, in order that the obligations that my prefix, prefixes, social, queer, post-colonial, feminist, international, place upon me. I want to enact them through new conceptualizations of the entanglements of race, class, gender and sexuality, as well as empire. While these are also the threads from which our own cultural forms and our, indeed our psyches are woven. We must learn to read across them, discerning the patterns and the uneven attempts that these artworks enable us and make us see. Sometimes we have to look with the other and not at the other. Is not all knowledge situated, grounded, historical, as the great theorists Polanyi, Mannheim and Donna Haraway have suggested? Is not all thought difficult? And art is both situated and difficult. I remain defiantly committed to the difficulty of thought and I refuse to betray Adorno's maxim. Art isn't going to betray us all the time, but it runs terrible risks of mere aestheticization, of the real violence of a human world, while it is also true that art alone may own be the one thing that can give us some brief moments of an encounter with that, that real, despite the commodified and financialized and pacified forms in which art currently comes to us as a site of consumption and entertainment. Art, thought and difficulty have been my project. Thank you so much. <laughs>